good afternoon and after that uh, very interesting session on uh, fintechs and banks and the earlier one on uh, digitization we have uh, a, another very exciting and interesting uh, segment to discuss which is nbfcs uh, and nbfcs you can never you know get enough of discussions because it's it's such an interesting sector it's also always in the news for good reasons and otherwise and uh, i think uh, it's it's we have uh, three of the most uh, eminent people here to discuss that uh, two of them belong to storied groups and uh, we have uh, mr gupta from dun and bradstreet and i think we'll get uh, cut right to the chase um, i think uh, the first question i would like to ask you ramesh uh, is you know we've had i i want to two or three year time frame given the kind of uh, you know in the environment we are in uh, where banks are uh, converting themselves into uh, of course uh, fi almost into fintech companies fintechs are getting into the financial uh, arena in a big way and then there is the nbfc somewhere in between neither banks nor fintechs nbfcs of uh, big ones are converting themselves also into digital big super digital players uh, where do you see uh, the next 3 to 5 years the nbfc space and where does an nbfc fit in in the overall new uh, world uh, scheme of things so nbfcs are not new right i mean we've been there for 50 60 70 years and different points of times different disruptions nbfcs have faced i think what nbfcs have done well for themselves is very clearly identified the customer segment that they want to work with right and at every stage having identified that segment we have come out with products that suits the customer i don't think nbfcs have played a very standardized role of saying oh this is what we have please buy it we have always designed product that suits the customer needs and which is the reason we have been able to overcome any disruption at any point of time and if you look at each of the nbfc while we are all called nbfc as an industry and you look at within the nbfc industry you have different players doing different things but they are all specialist in what they do right right and that specialized approach with a very focused customer identific identified customers and product designed for them is what has made nbfc extremely important and you will therefore see our participation in the overall economic growth is going to be pretty robust your views uh, manish yeah i think sort of uh, firstly just thank you for having me here uh, and you know let me build on what ramesh said right? this is the oldest question and in this in, in many ways it's been this strange kind of question 25 years ago also the question used to be posed differently in saying why should nbfcs exist when banks in theory can do everything nbfcs can and i think just whenever in doubt it always helps to remind ourselves just look at it from the customer's point of view you know you opened and saying there's a fintech there's a bank somewhere in between that is a non bank lender view from the customer's point of view it's just which institution delivers the best for me for what it is that i'm looking for so i think um just like you know looking outwards from some decades back on to now um what role are these institutions going to play as long as so let's say you know where we are today um i think 25 lakh crores is the sum total of non bank lender books you know there are over 10000 of us active inactive large small so um i think the i think a lot of it is going to be in theory whatever a bank whatever an nbfc can do a bank can do whatever a you know a non lender can do someone else can do the question really is to ramesh's point what are the areas you add value in sometimes it is looking at risk differently sometimes it is looking at customer segments differently other times it is looking at the similar customer customer segments but just delivering outsized value because you're very very focused on that particular customer segment you know in in some cases it would be how do you finance a tractor in our case it would be how do you make a home purchase possible and therefore last not least in this piece it is about 
in fact not only does the customer no longer care about you know whether it's a bank non bank it's about you know uh, how are you fulfilling my needs i think it's going beyond in saying as a customer i no longer even care if the two of you are partnering to deliver a better promise a better product to me it could be a bank and a non bank it could be a non bank and a fintech it could be a bank and a fintech it doesn't matter what am i getting delivered and does that add more value to me than the other alternatives and as from an outside perspective what is your sense of where the nbfc sector itself is heading sure so first of all thanks for having us here having me here to india today good to see lots of familiar faces the two the, the the point you made about the two doyen groups mr dan and mr bradstreet would be a little upset about that <laughs> given that dan and bradstreet's been around two centuries but yeah i'm no, from an nbfc and i know i'm none and of course the indian groups you said so no i think from an outside uh, uh, in looking perspective i think two quick things you know i think manish referred to that as a user as a consumer first of all there's enough to be done um, so there's enough need for all segments including the nbfcs in a big way and i think i think towards his closing thing manish also referred to i think the big daddies in certain segments of the market will not be able to do much without the capabilities which some of these folks bring to the table in terms of making things happen in terms of sourcing things in terms of structuring things so i think i think there is a value there's a role there there's a room there and very prevalent in what's needed around town ramesh uh, over the last few years we've seen a few you know uh, problem areas which nbfcs have been involved in for instance you've seen dhfl you've seen ilfs you've seen even uh, you know bashray and others uh, falling and you know there's been and, and almost causing systemic uh, uh, risks uh, to that uh, in, in because of that now uh, that as in a sense has also given the nbfc sector a kind of a question mark a, sh a cloud around it i mean there are of course as i said earlier there are the the very well known ones like yourselves but then there are these question marks around the sector itself because of the uh, developments of the last few years now how do you see that and what are the things the nbfcs need to then therefore be wary of so that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past you know i've always believed for very long while all the questions asked to nbfcs on the asset side but the collapse or a failure of an nbfc always happens from a liability side either you've not managed your capital well or you've not managed your liabilities well or you've not had good governance and you collapsed or whatever so whenever some things like this happen for businesses which are extremely well governed and has managed its balance sheet very well becomes even more important to the system so let's first get that clear to say that yes in industry you will have some collapses some wrong doing somebody not doing it well etc etc but the but, size and scale ramesh the size and scale of these collapses have been pretty significant so it does bring pressure on balance sheets like us we are also large immediately there is a knee jerk reaction that happens in the market sometimes liquidity can become little more uh, difficult to raise all of that will begin to happen i think those things should never scare a well run nbfc i think we should be fundamentally very clear as to what we are doing is it the right way of doing it and have we been transparent in communicating what we are doing i think what it reminds all of us over and over again is you will have difficult times we have had one of our worst times in the first quarter of last year when the pandemic hit us but will you wait for somebody to ask you a question or will you reach out and say what has caused this and what are those three actions you are taking by which you believe that things will change and then are you able to demonstrate that what you said is actually happening and if you do that then you get all the benefits out there right because some of the wrong doings that we hear of and we read about i don't think it's caused because of the business model or it's caused because of you lent to a wrong customer or whatever right i'm i'm pretty sure people knew what they were doing was not right maybe the governance basically. right so that's what i said i mean if you're running a financial institution it doesn't matter whether you're a money lender or whether you're a bank any format of financial institution needs highest order of governance and highest order of transparency you know just a last comment that i would make every time there is a new regulation that gets announced 
right? The question that gets asked is, oh, is this regulation little too tight? Is it too much? And I've always felt and believed that, yes, when the regulations do get announced, it's not very easy to implement them. But once you've done it well, you've taken it into your business model, your balance sheet only becomes more stronger. A quick example is we all started with NPA 365 days when I joined the industry. It became 180 days. We made noise. It became 90. We made noise. Today it is daily stamping. We made noise, but all of us have moved to that very smoothly. I think it's a question of when you look at the regulation and we must all believe that the regulation is being done to strengthen your balance sheet. It's not to weaken your balance sheet and become systemically dangerous. When you, when you're called your systemically important, I think the regulator does know that there is little more room for more regulation to make the balance sheets more stronger. So I think these kind of issues that will happen with some industry, in the industry, some players, it will happen. But you should be strong enough and you should know why have you set up this business, what's the purpose and stick to that purpose very clearly. I think you'll come out a winner. So are you then suggesting that the common thread between them is uh, governance issues? I would think so because uh, as I started by saying, if you have a problem on the asset side, your balance sheet can shrink a little, your profits can go down a little, you could delay growth for some time, but you collapse if your liability is not well managed and if your governance is not in place. Whatever be the size of your balance sheet, you may be large, small, whatever number you want to take, you take. But if your governance is not good, I, at some stage you will collapse. How long will you beat that turn? You will collapse. Manish, your thoughts? You know, I'm amazed, sort of that the almost every non-bank lender conversation starts with in the light of ILFS. If you total up the number of banking failures we've had in the last few decades and compare it to the number of systemically important non-bank failures, you'd see the banking column actually totals up. But rarely does a banking conversation ever start with in the light of banking failures this happened so strangely enough i find that we that's probably up, because of the recency factor also I mean, also there's a yeah. lot of cases I think which are part been. recency part the backstop that yes, just comes yes. automatically with banking, banking failures correct but to that i mean uh, that apart i think the one thing at the core it's you know you know, like you mentioned story groups or governance I think some of the challenges are embedded in the question, why did you get into this business in the first place? In the decades gone by, we did, as you know, like you mentioned recently, one of the things that I think regulatorily we've, we've gotten into a much better place now is that regulatory arbitrage used to be a good, good enough reason to be in this business. You know, banks can't do this, so as a non-bank we'll do this. They don't do this, that's why we, we can get into this space. If that is going to be a reason for you to be in this business, you're dead on arrival. And I think that's been plugged. Thereafter, a lot of some of the, you know, the failures are quite basic in nature. In the sense that, you know, we talk about ALM or we, we often sort of throw about more complicated sounding stuff. It's just that if you're going to give a 15 year loan and you borrow for two years or lower, lesser, that's just... ALM built in right there and is going to pose a risk at some point. Last not least, corporate governance says any entity at certain scale and above is going to be front and center. It has nothing to do with just financial services or lending or liabilities. Any business with corporate governance or, you know, just put differently a complete mismatch on what your business stands for versus how, you know, you as owners of that business make money. So three, four of these things are quite basic. Um, and I'm quite glad that just in general, um, regulatorily, just in terms of all of the, you know, law, whether in letter or spirit now, just pushes all of us in the same direction that if you're in it for the right reasons, you're going to have to think long term. And whether, you know, the nomenclature or your entity is called a bank or a non-bank, uh, if as an institution you're an important part of the financial system, these rules are going to apply to you. And, you know, if, if it works for you, be in this business. If it doesn't work for you, don't. Avnash, you think uh, that the essential, like uh, they're saying, essentially it is bad governance and just a bad way of running a business simply, which has caused these failures. 
I mean, uh, I won't comment on the specific things, but I think, you know, that's a, that's a pretty good reason why most uh, failures happen globally, not only in the financial services sector, but outside the sector as well. So, you know, just uh, looking back at my, uh, my own kind of uh, career, I worked in a bank, uh, big banks, uh, uh, and then moved to work in a, in a big four. And then I did some private equity, and now I run down in Bradstreet. Now, when I look back and talk to my colleagues, you know, I mean, the level of governance, the level of regulation which you see uh, working in a HSBC or a city bank, the, and then to a big four, which also is kind of regulated, I did non-regulatory work, and then a private equity, which is just about, you know, doing the deal in many ways and making sure you make money, and on Dun Brad Street. So, I mean, the oversight is, is, is great, it's good, it's good to have, and especially when you're dealing with the, the large systematic players here. So, I think, you know, the consolidation as a, as a nature of uh, business, as of industry, that's bound to happen as the, as the whole ecosystem evolves and matures. So, no, nothing wrong there. I think failures, bad apples are everywhere. They need to kind of get rotten someday, which has happened in some cases. But that shouldn't be the le point of starting a discussion or starting an outlook on any sector, any industry. And I think you have bad plays everywhere, you have good plays everywhere. You choose who you want to do business with and you choose your partners carefully, hopefully when you learn lessons, when you see things go wrong. That's right. Ramesh, uh, regulatory arbitrage is a point which uh, we were discussing just before the session. I was discussing with Manish. And like he rightly says, that cannot be the reason why you get into this business. This business has to make sense for you as, a, as an NBFC player. Now, but as regulatory arbitrage shrinks, the, the differences become very, very low, uh, you know, less in terms of regulation. Uh, what, what is the kind of uh, challenge which an NBFC will face? Uh, and I'll come to some of the newer players who are coming in that discussion I will come to later. But at this point, what is the regulatory, what is the outlook you see as far as regulatory arbitrage is concerned? You know, we started off with that discussion, right? NBFCs have created space for themselves. I don't think the NBFC as an industry asked for this gap to be maintained. They were existing then mm. and over a period of time they have shrunk, right? NBFCs are built around customer-centric models. We've reached out to customer, understood their needs, designed a product for them. That's what we started off with. So these arbitrage shrinking, is it going to create a problem for NBFCs? My personal view is no, because the models are not built on that to say, like we had the earlier comment, where if the profits or the margins were made because of these arbitrage, then yes, you have a challenge there. But they were available incidentally. I don't think the models were built on that, right? And therefore, we have to very clearly recognize that if you can raise three-year money, do three-year lending. Don't do a 10-year lending and imagine that you'll make money because of that, right? So I think these are all very specific, specialized models where we know how to lend. And then if you look at really NBFC's model, while we do a lot of things on the lending side, but they are all very strong recovery-based models. And there, there is no arbitrage, right? It's a business model outcome. And that's the reason we're very successful on the retail side. So as an NBFC, if I go and do a lot of wholesale lending, we could have a different problem. And likewise, for a bank, it could be very different. If you were to do a lot of retail and you have to go out and physically recover, you could have a challenge. So we have to recognize the strengths of NBFC and then built a model around that, rather than imagine that arbitrage will help you to succeed. Manish, your thoughts? Yeah. And if I can just switch that a little bit, because, you know, uh, uh, not much to add to Ramesh's points there, I think. So, if we just move arbitrage as a much more of an old world advantage and look forward, the less we, and increasingly, and, you know, we are a new, we are a new player, we are only two years old. And where, you know, so what you're not excited about is that there's a different set of rules for banks, different set, forget that. From a customer point of view, you know, what we're most excited about, and you know, lots of people here in the audience are people who work in financial services, small business part, is what we're most excited and the largest opportunities and partnerships. Let's take a couple of examples, right? One, it's we're very comfortable as non-banks where we may borrow from a bank, in some cases, we will partner to deliver better value to customer. In some cases, we'll compete. 
against the very same institutions that we borrow from. But very, very often what tends to happen is there are different parts of the puzzle from a customer's point of view you can put it well together. For instance, you want to underwrite faster than anyone else has done before. The way you're going to be able to deliver that value is half of that actually you're going to partner with someone who does it better than you. How do we authenticate a customer? How do you quickly digitally pull all of the docs that can then allow you to underwrite, get a one view going? All of those are by partnerships that you don't build yourself. From a customer's point of view, however, you're delivering real value. Uh, it may actually be three different institutions coming together to deliver that. You know, go further even. Not every asset, you know, the originator is not always the same as the balance sheet provider. Again, if we're going to grow this market together, you know, earlier we spoke about the need. Let's just take a little bit of perspective. The US is what, about six times our size as just India, GDP to GDP, right? There are 4,000 financial services players, just lenders alone in that market. It's, you know, if you go past 100 in India, you're hard pressed to come up with names. So A, it's a myth that it's overcrowded and lots of people fighting over the same customers. And therefore, the opportunity is not so much, assume that regulation is given. Do the right thing, whether the regulation is out there already or it's going to come. If it hasn't already come, it will. And look at saying that if A plus B and C between us, you know, if, if put together there's better value to be created, we'll just grow this market that much faster because nobody is going to go as we are from, let's say, 3 trillion to 5 trillion and 5 to 10. That delta that's going to come is going to come via partnerships. We don't have to worry about saying regulations will loosen and then we'll grow. And the stage at which India is in, there is enough to be had in terms of partnerships as well. I mean, it's not Absolutely. just a completely competitive Absolutely. landscape. I, 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 no. Yeah. Uh, from, from a Dun & Bag Street perspective, I mean, how do you see this whole change in terms of the regulatory arbitrage shrinking and like they both agreed on that that is not really a challenge. It's how you, you know, sort of collaborate if necessary to get the best value to the customer. How do you see it from an external perspective? I think, um, I think the, the, the way to look at it, as Manish said, is, you know, there is enough to be done. Um, the regulator, the regulatory framework will do what it continues to do, which, um, and those, those agendas also are quite clear. But as a, as a person operating in that environment, you've got to manufacture some growth for yourself. And if the economy is growing at some rate, you've got to grow at some multiple of that. And the best way to do that is to focus on the market and possibly through partnerships, possibly through better integration with data providers and all of that, which is all available to the entire ecosystem. So I think the, the regulatory arbitrage, the regulatory regula the overarching framework will always remain. I guess every country has it. India will have it in some shape or form as well. But because there is enough to be done, I think there will always be room to grow and provide that service to the market. Ramesh, we, uh, you know, we spoke about, you, you talked about, you know, giving customized solutions for the, for the client. Now, uh, it, banking and, and the financial sector broadly, if I may use the word, is getting commoditized in a sense. Like a lot of people are looking at similar products, technology becoming a sort of common theme across the board. How do NBFCs then, are you, are you then suggesting that each NBFC should then look at a niche or a few uh, uh, products which it can then excel in? You seem to suggest that. If you look at today within NBFC, we are all specialized in our own way. If you were to talk of us, we are very specialized by geography. We want to do a lot of work in semi-urban rural market. Mm -hmm. Right. There will be someone else who will be very strong in a pre-owned vehicle. Some will be very strong in personal loans. So already that specialization has happened. I think what I'm also trying to let you know is while all this is getting commoditized, we have to become solution provider. And the solution is not just while lending. Mm. I mean, we go through it all the time. If a monsoon fails, you need to provide a solution to your customer, give them some more time, partner them if you have to recover your money. I think the NBFC model is by nature built that way. Even if you look at money lender on the other extreme end, not regulated, but he's also in the lending business, mm -hmm. His only success is he's able to provide solution to someone's problem, right? I think the NBFCs are very specialized in understanding needs of the customer, either while lending or while recovering. 
But that's what banks also are saying, you know, they are also going to the last mile uh, through technology and otherwise. But the fact remains it. that everybody is not getting credit easily. Hmm. And therefore, there is a customer for every entity out there. Right? How deep is the credit penetrated? Today, we're talking of, we are present in 400,000 villages of the country where we have customers. But if you ask me, in every village, is every customer has been given credit? The answer is still no. So that's how microfinance is able to do for one segment of customer. Different, different NBFCs and they are all specialized. You take the regional NBFCs, they are so specialized. They know everything about the area where they operate and therefore they are super successful. So if you ask me, there is a very clear solution in the minds of every NBFC in the segment they are operating in and they are willing to live that life and partner with the customer to make it a success. Manish, you... Yes, yeah, and again... The question you ask could be asked of any business, right? There is a market, there are an existing set of players. What is your right to win? You're absolutely right. I think sometimes it's a bit of a misnomer that banks can't do last mile. There is no way you can, you know, you can match all of the PSU banks collectively in terms of geographic split. But I'll give you two examples to make the point. If all we allow ourselves to be judged on in who's going to give the cheapest loan, we will die. There is no opportunity for us to work. Two examples. In our housing finance business, we define our goal as saying, there are, there are a bunch of elements that will go into someone choosing us or not, but the problem definition is not whose is the cheapest loan. The problem definition is, why is the person not buying a home? What role can we play to help buy that loan? Sometimes it has got to do with product design, which is you allow for unequal payments instead of just the same standard payments because people have cash flows to manage. You have to sell one home, get into a new home. Can you facilitate resale? Make, if so, if the problem definition is help the person buy the asset, buy the home, you will come up with solutions which don't always just rest on saying everybody does this, I will undercut it by this. Uh, Second, which is the bulk of what we work to do, work on, is on the SME, especially on the MSME side. Very often, lending is one of the things you need to do to enable that business growing. What else? And that, therein, I think, you know, where conglomerates like, you know, ourselves can come in and play a role in saying, if the, if whom you're lending to, if their business grows, if their ventures flourish, a, they become more credit worthy. Second, credit demand gets created from business growing. Credit, you know, you don't want credit for its own sake. Yeah. Nobody ever woke up in the morning saying today is a great day to borrow. It is about saying if this was possible and I've got avenues to earn more money from where I invested than in what it cost me to borrow. So these are just two examples where, again, the nature of the entity doesn't matter. A bank can do this, a non-bank can do this, two guys partnering can do this. Are you adding value to, are you just making that particular um, asset productive? Therein lies the answer in saying, then do we have the first try to become the financer of that asset? But uh, just coming back to our original discussion on uh, the problem areas, do you think, you know, and I need to ask this of both of you, uh, you know, in, in terms of pedigree, because you are backed by a Mahindra group, very, very respected, you are at Godrej, do you think that will also have a, have a sense of uh, kind of uh, stability and calm for the uh, client and customer? So from our perspective and, you know, seeing from the last two years, I, we, uh, we definitely think so. And not, not for any other reason. Um, I think some of the challenges that people faced as consumers, you know, specifically in saying that there is a going in pricing and, you know, what does your reputation mean to you? And therefore, only one part of the equation is what are the terms of, you know, financing when we went in? Because these are all variable loans, what will it become a year from now? Can I take your word for it? So I do think it, it plays out in two ways. Uh, without a doubt, uh, you know, speaking for ourselves, without a doubt, just what the group brand stands for is important to the consumer. And it puts a responsibility on us in saying, I have these expectations of you, you better deliver to them. Uh, the second is institutionally, you know, to Ramesh's point, a very large part of us being su successful is going to depend on how we manage our liabilities. But access to those liabilities, you know, at terms in which you can then compete 
with players is is important and you know coming from the sort of parentage we have is is certainly helpful your thoughts avinash uh, i mean i think uh, i think the differentiation i guess there's been enough talked about that i think maybe and maybe you are leading up to that as well uh, because i was not here for the pre chat you guys had is the differentiation which is as an outsider as done in brad street and i guess most of us here free see from outside what's happening in some of the nbfcs we met an nbfc earlier this week not even a large nbfc and i was surprised that they had 147 people in tech and they had 45 people in data analytics mm. i mean that kind of differentiation which seems to be happening at, in the business is quite remarkable that you know the amount of investment the amount of uh, investment not only in technology but just in software and hardware which folks are putting in in terms of getting those niches or markets where they want to operate or be so good at it that you know they are able to do a lot better in terms of just in terms of finding the right customer and then collecting better and then you know having the right kind of courier quality that i think is going to be the big differentiator as an outsider uh, the market will i guess you know keep pushing folks who provide capital to wherever the needs best are no it's a very valid point you make and i want to ask this of ramesh you know in an earlier panel discussion on technology uh, one of the smaller sized banks were you know he was talking about the fact that today if you invest in technology you actually are a bridge between the small and the big you don't really you can sit side by side with the biggest bank and offer the same facilities to the customer because of use of uh, you know you the access to the customer becomes easier so how much of technology is going to now drive nbfc in the coming days I mean, gone are days where we can believe that we will do everything by ourselves, mm -hmm. right? So you need to recognize technology is two ways. If you're going to partner with anybody, they expect you to be technology ready. Otherwise, they don't want to associate. That's with you, right, right? So therefore, your readiness towards that is a must. Two, if you're going to grow in size, it's not possible to manage large size unless you have adequately and appropriately invested in technology. Two. three if you have to deliver services to your consumer wherever they are with speed without sacrificing on any of the quality parameter technology is a must i mean why we even have to discuss that this has become one of the key enabler to success of any business as much as treasury is as important an nbfc i think technology is sitting in equal ground there it's no more just playing a role of control an mis of mm -hmm. the world it's a decision making tool almost mm -hmm. right and therefore not to look at technology on a stand alone basis look at the quality of the data that you have and of course add to that the knowledge that the institution possesses about the business you put the three together you create a magic out there manish you said a little while ago that uh, godrej capital is 2 years old you know you know one of the newer players and then there are very old and very uh, well established players already in the business now what do you think have has driven players like godrej the pune walas vedanta uh, adanis and now you have we will come to it probably as a separate question the geo uh, entry coming up so what exactly is the what is this that you see in this business that has driven a group like godrej to come to the business so speaking for ourselves uh, I, i think of a few things one is the i think generally from a macro perspective you know consolidation and uh, polarization sort of played out in various businesses from the group's perspective we saw it in our real estate business and felt that a very similar uh, macro was playing out uh, because again regulatory um, from a capital allocation perspective it's all moving in the direction in saying uh there's no magic 3 to 5 year period in which sort of you know you're going to be able to release your money you're going to have to think multi decadal so it plays to the strengths of the larger groups that can you know set aside capital set aside time and just allow for the runway um i think what's common to uh, you know some of the folks that you spoke about uh where you know people like us getting in say this is our right to win is just one what the brand means to the consumer uh 10 15 years ago the lenders brand didn't seem to matter as much as it does today today whether you know you're taking money or you're giving money what the brand stands for is important access to capital willingness to deploy it access to liabilities is an important ask and i think one which is an under uh, underspoken about fact is access to customer ecosystems 
That's right. That allow you to get started, demonstrate your value to an existing ecosystem. So, for example, in our case, if we build a, you know, when we start with a housing finance business, you first uh, look at customers buying from the group and then expand elsewhere. You know, when we build a supply chain business, when we look at, we have an agri ecosystem, we have, you know, consumer uh, products ecosystem where you look at innovating within the ecosystem, showing value and then going outside. So I suspect it's a common, you know, that's similar uh, where as groups get in and saying there's now, there's now, uh, you know, a competitive advantage in coming with these mm. and, you know, just um, arbitrage isn't a reason to do so, yeah. which is why I suspect you see these. These are certainly big drivers from our perspective. Uh, yes, yes, please. You know, the NBFCs or financial institutions, whatever, they have to come and expand the market. Always this question gets asked as though the market is going to remain of the same size and more players are going to come and compete there. If that is so, we would never have come up if the banks were there and they were to do what they were doing. Whether the OEMs accept or not, we believe that as NBFCs, we have expanded the market. We have created more consumers. I mean, we talked about your ability to understand the need and provide the credit and therefore encourage them to acquire an asset. So more players will come, but why will they want to do the same thing that all of us are doing? They will come and do something else. They will come and do something more. And you will see the market expand. That's, that's actually true. Uh, Nasha, I want to ask you, as RBI is nudging bigger and bigger NBFCs to convert more or less into banks in some form or the other, what is, how do you see that play out? Do you see that happening more and more? Or do you see NBFCs becoming bigger but uh, you know, content to be uh, in their own space? Sure. So just before I answer that, I'll share an anecdote on the tech side. because You were talking about tech. You know, I had worked in uh, Citibank where everything was to be done differently and everything had to be outsourced and tech was a big uh, kind of partner. And then I moved to HSBC in uh, London that time. I was uh, in banking, investment banking and that time TCS was thinking of an IPO. So I took Mr. Ramadurai to see Sir John Bond who was the chairman of HSBC. Then and HSBC never outsourced anything at that point in time. Now it's different. And they used to spend something like 3% or 4% of sales on tech, which was a very large amount. So Sir John Bond told Mr. Ramadurai that, you know, uh, you know, Mr. Ramadurai, tech is not the tail. Tech is the dog. I remember those words very, uh, very, very clearly. You know, banks that time, HSB, like banks like HSBC, that tech is all in-house. We don't outsource tech. We do everything ourselves. And how the world has changed for everybody from that point in time. So I guess things will keep evolving. I think that's that's what we are saying um, on the tech side. On the NBFC, RBI, regulatory banks, you know, that's a debate way above my pay grade, I would say. Uh, you know, those things are very, you can say things which will uh, maybe right, maybe completely wrong. But I think, you know, in terms of uh, where the regulator sits, the, the, the regulator is doing its job, uh, his job. In terms of you know how do you make the market more um, you know rule out all the issues which have happened the failures which have happened so I think they're just doing the job from their point of view I think my from where I sit from where all of us sit possibly is there's enough to do there is enough there is a need as we've said for players like the NBFCs there's need for the banks so I think both will coexist and hopefully harmoniously and the regulator will allow that as well. Ramesh and Manish, uh, one last question before we wind up on the advent of geo. How do you both see it uh, as the geo financial services gears up to get into the scene in a big way? Well, at this stage, we can only say we'll partner and work together. Don't worry. <laughs> Manish, yeah, look forward. So far, you know, very rarely has have new entrants come and, you know, in most cases, markets grow. And therefore, there's plenty for us to look forward to. So, as a as a customer, I absolutely. Yeah, as a customer, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> Correct. Hate, hate to disappoint with an uncontroversial answer, but genuinely look forward. <laughs> no, it's it's a it's a fact that market will grow. It will not remain stagnant. Uh, and on this optimistic note, Ramesh, I have 
I know that you have a hidden talent, which I think we, we need to, you know, get something out of you in terms of you're a great singer and you have said this yourself. And I think, uh, you know, at this, you are within in the community of bankers and financial people. So as the NBFC, uh, you know, one of the key players in the NBFC, what is your message through a song? Let's, let's hear it from you. I know you are a very good singer, so you can't deny that. <laughs> Please, most welcome. No, but seriously, I mean, as to it, it enthuse the sector, what Since would your message be? All the questions were about yesterday. The, one of the oldest songs is Chodo Kal Ki Baate, Kal Ki Baat Purani, Nay Dor Me Likhenge, Milkar Nay Kahani, Hum NBFC. <laughs>